And uh, we are working our way through the book of Genesis right now. And we find ourselves in chapter 12, looking at the call of Abram. Abram, and then later Abraham. And uh, we uh, finished off last time in chapter 11, looking at the Tower of Babel. And then after the Tower of Babel, we saw that in chapter 10, they had the full genealogy of the three sons of Noah, but the oldest son, Shem, was last because he was the father of the lineage down to Abram. So last, but the most important. And it's so important (laughs) that in chapter 11, the very next chapter, they repeat it. Um, They repeat the genealogy of Shem, and then we uh, get to the very bottom of that genealogy, and it tells us about a guy named Terah in chapter 11, verse 26 of Genesis. And he lived 70 years, and he had kids, uh, three boys, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And um, Haran ended up dying and back when they were in the Ur of the Chaldees. But this is the first mention of Abram. And if you would, theologically, probably the most important guy in the Old Testament because he's the father of our faith, the Jewish faith, but also the Christian faith. And also, he's the one who brought about the most important concept that salvation's by faith. And he's the first guy that his faith uh, is documented to please the Lord. And... um, We'll see that in chapter 22, but um, about one-third of the book of Genesis is about his life, a good portion of it, and, um, and we're going to see that uh, he was a very unique person. So try, try, to, try to see it a little differently here, that you, you got guys like Noah that was called for a mission. When the mission was over, pretty much it's the end of Noah. Moses was called for a mission. And when Moses' mission was over, that's pretty much all you hear of Moses. But when it comes to Abraham, you never quit hearing about him. As a matter of fact, he continues on in the New Testament. Uh, probably one of the most important books in the New Testament, the book of Romans, talks all about him in Galatians. Uh, two very doctrinal book, and all the way into eternity. Because uh, the Jews are always, always going to be, even the millennial reign and after the millennial reign in the new heavens and new earth, the Jews are there as a separate people um, still unto God. And uh, by the faith of Abraham, everybody through, into uh, the end of all times is, is saved by having exactly the same faith as Abraham. That's the, the guide. That's the litmus test. Am I right with God? Well, do you have the same faith that Abraham has? That's always the question. And uh, the same with David. David's a guy, you hear about him, and you never quit hearing about him. Matter of fact, all the way into the millennial reign, Jesus is sitting on the throne of David. King of kings and the Lord of lords sits on a man's throne, but he's happy to do it. He's, yeah, I'm on the throne of David. And, uh, and it, it appears that's going to be true into all into eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. So Abraham, David, these are select guys that, that really are unique. But Abraham is really the foundation, uh, the beginning of something that will never end. And that is all those who become children of Abraham through the, the faith of Abraham. But His claim to fame, you know, David was the great king. Moses was the great lawgiver. Abraham's claim to fame is he was a friend of God. In James chapter 2, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. In 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, Are you not our God and drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? I mean, it's one thing to have great friends in high places. 
And, and I guess you can't outdo that. But then it's really great when you got a forever friend. Do you know what I mean? BFF forever. And Isaiah 41, 8, but you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. And so um, here's the neat thing, guys. The Bible tells us that God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And whatever he will do for one of his children, he feels that way about all his children. And if you're a parent, you know that's absolutely true. And so if God looked through the eyes of grace at Noah, God will look at the, through the eyes of everybody with grace. And in the same way, if God wants to be Abraham's friend, he wants to be your friend. I'd say probably the two main things that happened in my life is the first one is when I really understood God loved me, Brian Newberry. I, I knew he loved the world and he sort of got stuck with me. That's the way I figured it. Sort of like a family reunion. You know, you're glad to see some of the family and other family. They're only at the reunion because they're family. Um, and you talk to them as little as you have to type thing. I, that was the way I've always pictured it. You know, God, sure, God likes cool people, but I'm not one of those cool people. So, um, you know, but there was a point where God told me he loved me. But then the other is that God likes me. That's pretty cool because, I, you know, I know he tolerates me. He's got to put up with me. I know he's got to get me to heaven. I was like, well, you believe, so come on in, you know. Uh, welcome to the family reunion. But, you know, um, I'm, don't, don't expect me to be hanging out with you. But, no, there was a moment in time where the Lord spoke to me. It was very healing. I, I like you. And the Lord likes us. He wants to be our friend forever. And Abraham... Uh, the man of faith and the reason he was God's friend is because he was the first to believe in God unto righteousness. Well, then we get down to verse 29 and 30 there of Genesis 11, and we discover that um, Abraham got married to a lady named Sarai, who later will be some Sarah, but she was barren. She couldn't have kids, which was huge in those days days. Now, we come to chapter 11, verse 31 and 32, and it says, Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from the Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now we come to chapter 12. And it starts out by saying, in Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I We'll show you. So now you're wondering, why is it saying he had talked to him? And then you take these chapter 11 passages and, and you start trying to say, well, I don't understand. Abraham was to go out. Why is Terah taking Abram? Why is Terah in charge here? And why do they stop at Haran? Well, the best commentary in the Bible, guys, is the Bible. And in Isaiah 51, verse 2, it says, Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you, for I have called him, what? Alone, and blessed him, and increased him. The best commentary we get is out of Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7. And there in verse 2 through 4, it says, and he said, brethren and fathers, listen. This is right before Stephen was stoned to death, his first Christian martyr. But he's trying to reason with these Pharisees and these guys, the same ones that crucified the Lord that are upset now with him. And he said, brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, listen, before he dwelt in Haran. 
Now, if you're just reading chapter 11 and you go on, you, you think God spoke to him, had spoke to him at Haran. No, that's not the case. Stephen goes on in verse 3 and 4, and he said to him, get out of your country from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And he came and he came out of the land of the Chaldees and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. So let me put the picture together for you. Abraham is living in the Ur of the Chaldees. To give you an idea where that is, picture the, the map of Iraq. You know, you, you, 20 years ago, I couldn't really say it, but now, you know, it's always in the news, and we know where Baghdad is in the middle of that map. And if you go about 220 miles down, which is south of Baghdad, almost to the Persian Gulf, not quite, you come to a place called Nazaria, Iraq, and really that whole region is the Ur of Chaldees. Let me tell you something else interesting. It's the same location, I believe, of the Garden of Eden. It's not that far away, because about 45 miles down from Baghdad is a place called Hilla, H-I-L-L-A-H, which is the ancient site of Babylon and the Tower of Babel. So let's go back into the Tower of Babel time. They're all unified there, and so was Abraham's grandparents, and they have, God scatters the world in languages, but Shem's family, or at least part of it, stayed right there, not too far from the Tower of Babel. Herodotus tells us that during his time, which is about 400 years uh, BC, he, he was still able to walk into the Tower of Babel. It hadn't completely disintegrated. Today, um, they still have a, a portion that they claim is part of the Tower of Babel. Uh, it's just a bunch of dirt there now, but um, I, think it's, I think it's probably correct. And then would be the later Babylonian Empire in that same region. And from that Tower of Babel, everybody against God, everybody with this religious spirit scattered to the world, idolatrous spirit throughout the world, and then some stayed right there. God scattered them, but some still stayed right there close by. And it's that whole area which was the ancient site of the Garden of Eden, ancient site of Babylon, um, the Ur of the Chaldees. And in, in, in San Diego, there's about 40,000 Chaldeans. And you go, oh, you're, you're from Iraq. No, I'm from Chaldea. They're very proud of that to this day. They do not consider themselves interesting, uh, as an Arab even. You go, oh, you're an Arab from Iraq. Nope, nope, I'm a Chaldean, even to this day. And uh, there's a lot of them that are really on fire born again Christians. You might know one, Dennis Agajanian, Chaldean. Yep, his dad owned a grocery store, the whole thing. They're, a bunch of, they're all grocery owners. They own the grocery stores in San Diego, and very prosperous. But Anyway, so time lapses after the Terra Babel, just a few generations, and God calls a guy out of the Ur Chaldees and says, Come and follow me. And he very specifically said, we saw in chapter 12, verse 1, leave your family and leave your father's house. Now, Tara was told this, evidently. I mean, probably Abraham's best thing would just to sneak out in the middle of the night, him and Sarah, and take off, and leave a note. But here's Tara, who lost his son Haran. That's, that hurts a lot. Evidently, he's not that close to his other son, Nahor, and Abraham said, Dad, I know it's not great timing, um, but me and Sarai, we're leaving. I don't know when we'll be back, if ever. And Tara evidently said, hey, great idea, let's go. But in this Arab culture, the patriarch is still in charge. So instead of Abraham and Sarah leaving and Abraham following the Lord, Tara says, let's all go. 
And here, Lot, you're raising Haran's son, Lot. He's like your own son now. You got to bring him along. And, and so Terah is clearly in charge. They don't get that far, and God stops them just a few hundred miles away. They name the place after his son that passed away, Haran. And Abraham's just biding time. And we really don't know how long. We're going to find out here in a minute. At this time, he's 75 years old. So he lost decades in Haran. You know what's interesting? If you look up the name Terah, it actually means to be delayed, to be delayed. We, we have a, a, a word in English, and it's called wives, to be delayed. You get, you know, how the, the women are always making you wait. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, too many women here, not a lot of laughs. Um, anyway, to be delayed. And then, um, there, thanks, Kurt. And... Uh, And then Haran, interesting enough, is barrenness, fruitlessness. Abraham was stuck in Haran, delayed in Haran, in a place of fruitlessness. But he waits till after his dad, Terah, dies. It's interesting, but you remember in the Gospel of Matthew when a guy said, Jesus, I'm going to come and follow you. And he said, let me first go bury my dad, which means let me wait till my dad dies and I take over the family business, and I get financially secure, then I'll follow you. And Jesus said, nope, you come and follow me now. Let the dead bury their own dead. Now, this sounds really harsh and cruel. But understand, in this Arab culture, you do not depart from your family. This is why so many guys have told so many presidents, you'll never get a democracy to work in Arab countries because they are tribal. They don't, they, their, their pride isn't in their country as much as it is in their tribe. They will be loyal to their tribe. And when you go into Arab countries, which I have, you go even to a large city area, you know, the name of the city, everybody's related. Everybody enters marries within their own family. They, they try to arrange, do you marry with your first cousin? That's normal. But everybody knows everybody, and they know you're not from there. They, they definitely uh, know who's who, and they're committed to that. So when Abraham is being told by God, leave your family, that seems like, wow, God's a mean dude. He's ripping and tearing. This is harsh. And then he makes it very clear, not just your family, your father's house. Leave my own poor dad. He just lost one son. He's going to lose another son. He's old guy, and he's not that close to Nahor. I mean, I, you know, that just seems horribly harsh. And then Lot, he lost his dad, and now I'm his new dad, and I'm abandoning him. That seems harsh. But you know what we're going to find out this week or next week? Abraham cursed his dad. <laughs> he let him go with him, and he's stuck in a place of barrenness until he died. We're going to see next week, he really curses his nephew Lot. However, the end in verse 3, it tells us that if you do what I say, Abraham, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I think Abraham's family was included in that. But to bless them, you've got to obey God in simple obedience. If you don't Obey God in simple obedience, you will have no obedience. God doesn't want big, giant things. He wants just simple obedience. Tiny little things every day, just like the the turtle, right? Not the the hare. Just plugging away little by little in your closet, in quiet, praying, seeking the Lord, giving, serving, whatever it is. But Abraham uh, couldn't get this. He only had a partial obedience. So he's in Haran, and he picks up with this nephew Lot, unfortunately still, and he heads to the promised land. And God had said to him, back in the Ur of the Chaldees, and he repeats the promise. And next week, we're only going to look at the first three verses here tonight. Next week, we're going to look at that then the Lord spoke to him. 
So literally the Lord spoke to him and God would have kept speaking to him. That was the whole point. The whole thing was so sweet, guys. Him and Sarah, just the two of them, they didn't have any kids, part of the plan. They would go live in a tent and tour the Holy Lands for many decades, just the two of them, and God would be revealing himself to them. I mean, does that sound sweet or what? And Israel in those times was a very wooded place with lions and bears, and it was a beautiful place more than it is today. Today it's a pretty barren wasteland for the most part, except for some dedicated places they planted trees and worked hard at to bring it back. But um, it would have been so sweet. But you know, Abraham, he mucked it up. We're going to find when he left Haran, he made a lot of money there. And he has all kinds of peoples and servants. It was always complicated. Then the next, he's going to go down to Egypt and get more money. In particular, it says a lot of silver and gold. You know the thing you don't want when you're out in a tent and you're to pick up and move around like a nomad is boxes of silver and gold. And Abraham had boxes of silver and gold that he never was able to even spend. He literally complicated with all kinds of animals and servants and boxes of gold and boxes of silver that he just carried around from location to location his whole life, uh, never able to even use it. And so God had a really sweet plan, but it took, it required faith. And let me just tell you, God's commandments are never to hurt you, never to bind you up. God's promises are always to bless you and to free you up. His father, Terah, it tells us in Joshua 2, was an idol-worshiping person. And interesting, later Jacob, you remember, goes back to the Ur Chaldees, to his cousin's house, Nahor, and, and all their family. And guess what? They're all idol worshipers. And when Jacob takes his wives and he leaves, Laban comes looking for him because one of the wives of Jacob took all the, the household idols and he was mad. He wanted those idols back. So, um, and then remember years later when Joshua takes him into the promised land. They still had idols. So Abraham, this is, this is radical. Because Abraham is not some special person. He's just another Arab from Iraq. His dad, Terah, wasn't a Jew. His brother, Nahor, wasn't a Jew. Or a Hebrew, as they called it here in Genesis. But Abraham, just this regular old Arab Iraqi, would follow God and he would become a brand new race of people from him and Sarah forward. It's a radical thing when you think about it. Well, going back to chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, and it tells us there, Now the Lord had said, past tense, to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So we, we hear this big line of blessings that God said, I am going to do it no matter what. So understand, God called Abram. Abram gave him partial obedience. <laughs> Did God throw him away and go find another Abram? No, the Lord waited. And it ended up taking decades before Abram finally got to the land. And then he made a mess of things, but God never stopped his faithfulness to him. And if you look there in verse two and three, he said, I will show you, I will, the, the power of God, the authority of God, the sovereignty of God, I will make you, I will bless you. I'm going to accomplish these things. And he says, I will make your name great and I will make you a blessing. I think David meditating on this years later in Psalm 37, verse three through five, he said this, trust in the Lord 
and do good. And then like Abraham and Sarah should have done, (laughs) dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. How sweet it could have been. Him and Sarai living in a tent, wandering around everywhere they put their foot would one day be the property of their kids, their eternal possession. And God speaking to them, and we're going to see that he would make an altar and worship God. And, And this was delayed, but God didn't stop in his faithfulness towards Abraham. He said, I will make you a great nation. Later in Deuteronomy, God says, why did I pick you? Because your numbers were high? You, didn't, you weren't a very populous group. It's because you guys had something special to give me? You had nothing special. I'm going to tell you why I picked you. Because I set my love upon you. And I chose to make you a special treasure unto me. That was such a revelation. And so this would become a, a great nation. And in Genesis 13, 16, he says, I'm going to make your descendants as the dust of the earth. In Genesis 15, he says, I'm going to make your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as many. Um, and then in, in Genesis 22, 17, he says, as many as the stars of the heaven and the sand of the sea. So I'm going to make your descendants cover the earth like dust, like sand, like stars in the heaven in number, I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm going to make your name great. We find in Genesis 22, when Abraham really deeply touched the heart of God. And this is when he offered his son Isaac up as an offering. And God said, now your name shall be great. Because you did not withhold your son, your only begotten son. And he said, in, in blessing, I'm going to bless you. And multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. And, uh, and God indeed made Abraham's name great to this day. And he said, I'll bless those who bless you. And I'll curse him who curses you. Barnhouse, in his commentary, made a note that the Greeks overran Palestine and desecrated the altar in the Jewish temple, and they were soon overthrown by the Romans. The Romans killed Paul. Titus came in, destroyed Jerusalem, and Rome soon after that fell. Spain came in with the Inquisition against the Jews, and now is a fifth-rate nation. Poland had the progromos, and that's a a time when the, the Catholic Church was dominant in Poland, persecuted the Jews. Hitler in Germany, and we know what happened there, the anti-Semitism and the the murderous ways, and God brought that nation down. Britain horribly persecuted the Jews, especially after World War II, when they were trying to return to the Promised Land, and they stopped them and did everything they could to please the Arabs and persecuted. And if you look at the United States, we were the first nation to recognize Israel as a nation. And if you look after World War II, remember it said of the Britain Empire, the sun never set on the, on the English Empire because they had Africa and India and all the way around the world. It was sun, it was, the sun was shining somewhere on, on land possessed by England. But after World War II, England goes down. And if you look at us, our graph goes straight up like no other nation in the history of this world. And uh, you say, well, Donald Trump, you know, he really uh, made us prosperous. Far as I can tell, he was the most pro-Israel president that our country has ever seen. And yes, a lot of things he did that seemed to prosper. But I think God blessed those who blessed God's chosen people. And he moved, the, as you know, the, um, the embassy to Jerusalem. But far more than that, he was very much pro-Israel And God, I believe, blessed that. Well, and he said in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. How is that? Through the Messiah. Let's look at a few verses on this as we end here tonight. 
In Galatians 3, 7, therefore know that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. And then in Galatians 8 and 9, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, same way Abraham was, he preached the gospel to Abraham, we'll look at that in chapter 14, saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. And then those who are of the faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Paul points something out really interesting in Romans chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. In the NIV, I like the way it reads. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to him. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but also follow the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham before he was circumcised. So he is the father of all who believe. Why he was uncircumcised. We're going to see that says that in Genesis 15. Circumcision came in Genesis 17. In Genesis 4, or Romans 4, 16. This is great. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now follow this in Romans 9. He actually goes on to talk about this. In chapter Romans 9, 6, for they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children because they are of the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. Listen, those who are of the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So I want to help you understand this. Abraham had Ishmael but he was not counted according to the promise. Isaac was. But then you have, you say, oh, well, that's Hagar, and she's an Egyptian, and, you know, Sarah, she's the chosen one. Okay, (laughs) Isaac has twins. They weren't even born a second apart because Jacob had a hold of Esau's leg. But Esau, uh, you know, technically came out first, so he's the oldest brother, even though there was no separation between the two. But God rejected Esau, so Esau was not counted according to the promise, but um, Jacob was, later to be called Israel. So he, he says, who, who really are of the lineage of Israel? Now, here, here's something interesting. Today, Israel's law is, and it has been since the beginning of the, uh, 1948, is that you're a Jew and can, and can immigrate to Israel and be a citizen there if your mother and your grandmother both can prove they were Jews. Dad, doesn't matter. But if you use that reasoning, go back to the book of Ruth. King David couldn't be considered a Jew today. He's like the number one Jew, <laughs> most heroic Jew there is. Israel wears the star of David, but he wouldn't have passed that test because of uh, grandmother Ruth, right? So who is it then? Well, did you catch what happened in 1970? In 1970, there was a genocide going on in Ethiopia. Yes, the tall, skinny, black people. And they had heard that this group of Ethiopians had kept themselves separate for hundreds and hundreds, maybe even over a thousand years, and that they considered themselves ancestors of Solomon, that they were Jews and they kept the law. And so the nation of Israel goes down to Ethiopia and they look and they say, man, they're following the law, they're circumcised, they're all the way through. 
And they said, how can we say they're not a Jew? Now, this is way before DNA and all that. So they say, yeah, every one of them. And so they paid a bunch of money, a bribe to the government. They emptied out a bunch of 747s, no seats, just piled people in there. It, it's, it's pretty interesting if you ever get a chance to watch a documentary. There was dozens of babies born on the plains from Ethiopia coming in. And thousands of these tall black Ethiopians are Jews. They're in the, in the, so when you go to Israel, like, why are these tall black? Well, hey, when God said he was scattering them to the four corners of the world, he really meant it. You know, John Bonner uh, tries at least once, if not a couple times a year, goes to Tel Aviv because there's a big Mexican population of Jews. And he goes and, and witnesses to them in Spanish. Not Mexican, uh, Latino, all kinds of countries they've come from. The Jews in all over uh, the Spanish-speaking world. And uh, so really they are. I mean, um, as we talked about, most of the Jews are Agonazi Jews. We talked about that, the, the white Jews from Europe. But uh, even now, the, as people are leaving the Ukraine, all the Jews that are immigrating out of the Ukraine are going to Israel. And Israel's bringing them in by the thousands right now. So it's an interesting thing. Who is actually a Jew? Well, we say, oh, DNA. DNA is the proof of everything. Well, I think God has something greater than DNA. And that's like some kind of spiritual DNA he can see. And when somebody believes in him by faith, they get spiritual DNA. And they are the true Jews. Listen to what he has to say in Romans 9. Um, I just read that. Chapter 9, verse 23 to 26 now. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Hosea prophesied about this in verse 25. He says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people and her beloved who was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in place where it was said to them, you are not my people. They, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. Let's go on down to verse 30 of Romans 9 to verse 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles, you got 930 there, Kirk? Okay. Uh, so Romans 9, verse 30 to 33. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it's written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whoever believes on him, Jesus the Messiah, will not be put to shame. And what do we find in Revelation 5, 9? The great cloud of witnesses, thousands upon thousands, worshiping the Lord of every tribe, of every tongue, of every nation, of every people. Who are the children of Abraham that will be blessed like Abraham and then be a blessing like Abraham? It's those children of promise. Who are the children of promise? Well, after Christ, it's those who believe in him. Get the spiritual DNA that God can see. And those are the children of promise called sons of God. Because the blessing that God is saying, he's calling you, he called you. Just like Abraham, just this, all he knows is all these idolatrous ways. And God speaks to him and he's like, yes, Lord. Just as what happened to us. We were in our sin and, ah, don't bother me with church. That sounds boring. I don't want to know about God. I don't know about his Bible. I, I don't want... And then something happened and God grabbed a hold of us, our sinner, sinful heart. And we said, yes, Lord. And then slowly he directed us to himself and to the word and, and opened our eyes to be those people. And then the Lord said, 
I called you to be separate. You, you got to, I called you to be alone. What, what did Jesus say? In comparison, you got to hate your father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children. Yes, even your own hot life if you're going to follow me. And he said, if you're going to follow me, you got to know what it's going to take. It's denying yourself, taking up a cross and following me. It's like this. Those who want to lose their life will gain it. Those who want to find their life will lose it. So just like Abraham, it sounds ripping and tearing. But we have to seek first Jesus above all things. And then we can be blessed. And then we can be a blessing. But until we live under that spout where the blessings flow out, we're not going to be the blessing that in us, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's God's design, is that we would be fruitful as believers. Amen? Lord, thank you for your word tonight. And Lord, we just stop and, and uh, meditate on these things that, wow, we really are a Jew. We here are the Jews that, that you saw when you called Abraham. It wasn't Ishmael, it was Isaac. It wasn't Esau, it was Jacob. And it wasn't those who are calling themselves Jews and going to synagogue and having certain haircuts and certain dress. And it's, it's those who have the faith that Abraham had in you that we become the children of God and we become the children of God through Abraham. When just like Abraham, we believe in you, Lord, and you account that to us as righteousness. Mm.